الحمد لله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا بني يذهبوا فتحسسوا من يوسف وأخيه ولا تيأسوا من روح الله لا ييأس من روح الله إلا القوم الكافرون صدق الله العلي العظيم In the spirit that it is exam week for the students I think I should start my lecture by examining it the students at least the adults have an excuse uh, what was the last thing we discussed don't worry, I'm not asking the adults, only the students. <laughs> it has been some time. So just as a recap, Alhamdulillah, the idea here is everyone has some gist of the idea of the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. So the point of this wasn't just to mention his story, maybe for some they were learning it for the first time. But the point of his story was to take lessons from them. And we honestly... It is a honest, a great time to learn a lesson from Yusuf alayhi salam's story. Because today we are seeing something very similar happening in the world. It is not a one-to-one -one direct example, but it is something that a person was exiled from his own country. He was turned into a slave. And then one thing after another thing after another thing after another thing. But Allah's plan always happens. And Allah's plan happened today. We are going to see the final result of his plan. But he had to go through so much until for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him what Allah wanted to give him. So likewise, in the world today, we see what's happening. And some people have to be tested and they have to go through a lot of difficulty. See their own children passing in front of their own eyes. But it is a lesson and a, a reminder for you and I that Allah still exists. Look at their iman. If Allah were to test us in the same way, would our reaction be the same? If Allah were to test us how He tested Yusuf a.s., would our reaction be the same? This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us throughout Qur'an to show us. These, these are the reasons why these stories are mentioned in Qur'an. They're not there just for story time. They're not there just to say, cool, there was a person, he went through this and that's it. There's so many lessons. And the greatest lesson that Yaqub alayhi salam taught his kids, this is where we're starting today. It's the greatest lesson. The story was such, what happened? Yusuf alayhi salam was finally the person in charge of the treasury of the, of, of, the, of the country. It was his responsibility to keep the money and hold it and keep it in such a way where they could use it for the time being and that it is stored for the next seven years. That was his job. So he went to different localities, paying them for their grain so he could store it somewhere. Knowing what was to happen, that it was his responsibility. And while this is happening, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compels his own brothers to have to come to him. The same man, the same child, the same brother they kicked out, they have to now go to him. How many of us can say that if not in my own life, being a youngest child, I'm not saying this happened to me, mashallah, my brothers are amazing. If they're listening, they're amazing. I'm saying I've seen it with my own eyes, within my, within my own family. That when you're older, and as you're growing, you feel like you don't need your younger siblings, right? Except when you need them to fetch something for you. Grab this, bring that, grab this, bring that. But I've seen how when they become in need, then they, it's so hard to then come to your younger brother and ask for something. That's exactly what's happening to them. Again, what are we learning from this? Are we just learning a story? That, oh, look, Yusuf alayhi salam's brothers came and asked, Yaqub, uh, uh, asked him. No. It is for the younger sibling to learn a lesson. Look at how he treated them. Again, so, 
They come, they take from him the first time. And we know the story goes as the story goes. They come back the second time. And this time, he hatches a plan because Bin Yamin has to come with him. And the plan goes as such, he keeps Bin Yamin with him. They, he puts a cup in their bags and they find the cup in their bags. They're considered thieves. They called Yusuf alayhi salam a thief at that time. And now they have to leave. Not only did they lose their beloved son, Abi Yaqub alayhi salam, Yusuf alayhi salam, many, many years ago, now they lost Bin Yamin. So hard for them. They're going back. Now they're going empty handed. They don't know what to say. So the eldest brother stays back. The eldest brother stays back. The rest, they go. Or the, or the one who brought the bloody, bloody shirt. Wallah alam, there's different narrations. So now, the rest of them come back. And they say, ask the people, the, the caravan we came with, we're, tell, we're speaking the truth. Because this is common knowledge by now, right? Everybody saw what happened. This wasn't done behind closed doors. It was done openly. Everybody saw it. So, they went. Yusuf alayhi Yaqub alayhi salam, even at that time. قَالَ بَلْ سَوَّرَتْ لَكُمْ أَنْفُسَكُمْ أَمْرًا فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ Somebody says to you, such and such group, they did this, they did do that. But it doesn't befit the behavior of such a people, such a person, or such a nation, or such a group. I'm not, I'm not picking any certain topic. Don't put anything in your head. But somebody accuses another group of doing something so vile, that if we as own Muslims, we turn around and say, how could you do that thing? Yaqub alayhi salam listens to this nonsense, that my son is a thief? Ah, never. I couldn't believe it. You're saying that that group did such a vile thing? I mean, absolutely against Islam. And then they claim to be Muslims? Absolutely not. Anyways, I don't know. This is something you fabricated. Or your nafs makes you want to believe this. And that's what they propagate to the rest of the world. So the rest of the world can feel that way too. Anyways, Ishara, those who understand, understand. So now Yaqub alayhi salam, he goes in seclusion. These guys, they're making up stuff. But see, in the back of his mind, there's this person, this person who is so just, so honorable, that he would stick to the law and he would not cheat. He said, I'm going to do exactly what I'm asked to do. And that is, I take the person who stole. He's so just at how he distributes. When they came the first time, he gave them the back of his mind. He knows. Now, there are different narrations. Some people, some narrations are that the angel of death came to Yaqub alayhi salam and Yaqub alayhi salam straight up asked him, Is Yusuf, did you take the soul of Yusuf alayhi salam? He said, no. So maybe that's how you know. But realistically, when you think about a righteous individual in power, think about it today. Can we think of anybody who is in any politics, has some say in the rules of this country, that we can say, that I can spot a righteous person from amongst them? Or can we say that most of them are at least in it for themselves? That much minimum. Everything else is, right? Now imagine if there was a righteous person amongst them, would you not spot that person? Would you not say it's abnormal that a righteous person is amongst a group of people who worship idols? So now in the back of Yaqub, let's say if we took out angel of death and we took out all the visions and all that, but just rationally, Yaqub alayhi salam can understand something. That a righteous person like that so just in a country of full of idol worshippers, it doesn't make sense. So in the back of his mind, he's thinking, "This is you. Yeah, this has to be Yusuf." So now he's in seclusion, and he he cries, been crying for so long, he becomes blind or weak sighted, and he just they look at him and they say, "What is wrong with you? Like you're sitting here like, mourning over a person. It's been so many years. You know, just move on with your life. Move on." Yusuf in Yaqub says, Look, Inama Ashku Ali wa Husni ilallah. I'm only complaining to Allah. Don't worry about it. I'm not complaining to you guys. I don't need anything from you. My complaint is direct with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> and I know something from Allah that you don't know. Meaning, in the back of his mind, there's an itch that tells him that has to be Yusuf. Now what does he tell his children? This is what I wanted to highlight. I said, I'm going to start with this. This is where we are. It's the verse I recited. It is so important. Because Yaqub tells his children, who not only have lost Yusuf, they have lost Bin Yamin, now they have lost either another one of their brothers, whether that's the eldest or the most intelligent, whichever one it was. Three brothers are gone now. They start to feel a sense of despair. 
we didn't get anything the second time we went around. What's going to happen? And Yaqub says, when everything turns against you, and you feel like, man, what is there? What's left? You know, every, everything's going against us. And let me be very honest with you guys. Maybe none of you feel this way today. And may you never feel this way in your life. But there are really a lot of people in this world that are Muslim, by name at least. And they come to me, and they act, or they, they talk as if the world ended and they're still alive. Losing hope is really a sign of kufr. It is, because this is what Yaqub says. And you may think for a second that, oh, really, are there really people? Yes, they are. I mean, most of you probably aren't even thinking that, especially the adults. You guys probably know people, that, if it's not you yourself, ever gone through that experience in your life. They just lose hope, as if nothing can happen. And there are people today that think the same thing. They see people dying, and they think that that's it. There's not, nothing can happen. Ya baniya, ya idhabu. Mi Yusuf wa akhi. Oh my children, oh my beloved children, go, go out. Mi Yusuf wa akhi. Go find Yusuf, go find his brother. And never lose hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we see today, we and people are suffering. The beauty of their suffering is the moment that heart stops beating, it's over for them. It's over. They're guaranteed paradise. It doesn't need to take away from the suffering. But that's how beautiful it is to be a Muslim. That if you have to suffer, su- suffer and you are patient, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, see how many of us can spend the entire life practicing and then one moment shaitan can come and take it away. We can't guarantee it that before death we're going to die on Iman. That is why for us it's important to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, oh Allah, allow me to die while saying kalima. Allow me to die while on Iman. I'm telling you from experience to all of you, no matter your age, Iman is a very valuable thing. Shaitan never gives up. He never stops. He doesn't say if this man has been worshipping Allah for 60 years, 70 years, he's 80, he's 90, he's 100. He does not care. He is relentless. Your iman is the most valuable thing you have. And shaitan will never stop trying to pry, pry it from you. So don't ever for a second leave your guard. Put your guard down and say, I'm good. Look, I sit in his lecture. So many people don't even sit here. These thoughts, I, I'm just being practical right now. These thoughts, oh, I come for Jum'ah, that person doesn't. Or I come to the masjid and pray salah, even if it's not every day, at least I come, even if it's not every salah, I come every day for one or two salahs. These thoughts are the devil's thoughts. This is exactly what he wants to do to take away your iman. Because that is a sign of kibbah, of arrogance, of pride, that I am better than someone else. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in a hadith, Kibr is my clot. Kibr is my clot. And anyone who tries to take kibr, meaning and attach it to themselves, have pride in themselves, have pride in their ibadah, have pride in their wealth, have pride in their intelligence, have pride in anything, their clothes, whatever it may be. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is as if you were trying to pull Allah's cloak. Iman is that value. So shaitan is relentless. <coughs> but la tay asumir rohillah. La tay asumir rohillah. But never lose hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why is this important? Because when you find yourself in this situation, may Allah protect all of us, but Allah shakes your iman. It's just the rule of the world. Allah, the, the way Allah does, He shakes your iman sometimes. He, because He really wants to see is it just when it's comfortable and convenient? Or when it's inconvenient and uncomfortable, are you still staying as a Muslim? This isn't the topic, but it is important because of the times. And it's connected to this ayah. What does Yaqub says? 
innahu la yay'asu min ruhi Allah illa al-qawm al-kafir what did i say losing hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is kufr that's what yaqub alayhi salam said and see people don't even realize it i have spoken to people mashallah being that religious but something happens to them they get tested their sister has a some sort of disease and you know she's always, she has like mental illness and she's uh, basically majnoon you know, she, you know how hard it is to take care of a person like that may Allah really protect all of us and all of our children from generations to generations it is very very hard to take care of someone like that and you constantly question why her or why him why me and this person was asking me this why me that's, that's losing hope in the mercy of Allah. On the flip side, maybe she would have not been like this, maybe she would have died as a kafir. So Allah's mercy is upon you that He made you go through this because now your own ibadah isn't strong enough. But you take care of her because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it mandatory on you. And so what does Allah say? I give you Jannah because you took care of my sin. You never know. It's all about perspective. It's all about perspective. So back to the subject. Yaqub tells his children, go and find Yusuf Alayhi So they go. They enter the court. We're in poverty. We're in difficulty. Oh king, we're in difficulty. Remember there was an actual king. He was just the person who took care of the treasure. He said, we have gone through poverty and struggling. We don't have a lot. We've been hungry for so many days. We didn't bring you much. Meaning not enough for what you have been giving everybody else. We don't have much. We brought you very little. But can you give us full? Can you give us the allotted amount? That every time somebody comes, everybody is allotted X amount. Maximum, but they have to give X amount to get that maximum. And can you do on us? Meaning, can you give us more than what we're giving you? We can't give you equal. Now, at this point, I want you to understand Yusuf alayhi salam's situation. This whole time, he's trying to plot. His idea here is he wants Yaqub alayhi salam here, but he wants to do it in a way that they could finally recognize the error in their way. He sees his brothers. He sees them struggling. He knows that his father is struggling, his, his, uh, his stepmother is struggling, his family is struggling, and he sees them. And he feels a sense of, now is time. I can't, I can't watch this. I can't keep prolonging this. <coughs> so Yusuf alayhi salam says to them, قَالَ هَلْ أَلِمْتُمْ مَا فَأَلْتُمْ بِيُوسُفُ Do you remember what you did with Yusuf? Now at this point, they're sitting there, huh, the mention of Yusuf in this place? At this time? But they still can't recognize him. They start to think. They say, Yusuf? Are you Yusuf? Now, the Mufassirin say, this is how Yusuf al Islam he reacted. You know when somebody asks you a question or say, hey, I heard you did such and such thing and it's an amazing thing and you just smile. Like this. That's what Yusuf said. Smile. And now they're sitting there looking at him. Ah, oh, that has to be Yusuf. And they're asking, Qalu wa inna kalanta Yusuf. Oh. Ana Yusuf. Wa hadha akhi. Qad manna Allahu alayna. I am Yusuf. And that's my brother. Inna hu min yattaqi wa yasbir. Fa inna Allah la yudhiru ajra al-muhsineen. Indeed, the individual that fears Allah and the individual that is patient, Allah never wastes their reward. That's exactly what we see today. Allah never wastes their, wastes their actions. Everything that's happening, their sabr, their taqwa in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made other people accept Islam. How many, did you guys know this? There's so many people that have accepted Islam on the basis of what they've seen them do. Their Iman. Their Iman. 
really, if a nation like us would be tested like that, do you think our iman is that strong? I couldn't even bear the thought of my child being like that. That's their iman. And that's the plan of Allah. He wanted to guarantee them paradise so they could be a means of hidayah to many others who would have been guaranteed jahannam. You can try as much as you want. They can try as much as they want. But haq will always prevail. And this deen will always continue to rise and keep going forward. It doesn't matter how hard they try. Look everywhere you go. You think, you think after so much happening that people would stay away from Iman, of Islam. People would run away from Islam. But I'm telling you, more people come. More people come. More people want to understand. More people want to know what is this thing that everybody keeps going after. That's the beauty of Iman. That's the beauty of this deen. Now, <laughs> they hear these words and they see that Yusuf salam, this is Yusuf alayhi salam. It is said that even then, when Yusuf alayhi salam said, Ana Yusuf, they're still, they couldn't recognize him. So he had a crown that he was wearing. So he took his crown off and on the head he had a, a mark, a mark that his father Yaqub alayhi salam also had. So when he took it off, they saw that mark and then they recognized that, that that is Yusuf. That is the Yusuf that we put in the well. At this point, they say, Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has favored you over us. The beautiful response of a brother forgiving his siblings for the wrongdoing that they committed. Yusuf alayhi salam says, La tathriba alaykum al لا تثريب عليكم اليوم يغفر الله لكم وهو أرحم الراحمين لا تثريب عليكم اليوم means no rebuke no retribution no taunting no I told you so didn't if you would have listened to me this wouldn't have happened how dare you do that and now come to me no I don't forgive you for what you did to me you need to earn my forgiveness you hear it all the time you need to earn my forgiveness Yusuf alayhi salam, just hearing it. La tasriba alaykum. And this is exactly what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam conquered Makkah al-Mukarramah, and he was standing by the door of the Kaaba, they looked at him. All those people now, all the battles, the small little battles are over. And he's standing there, and they're all there. And they're looking at him, wondering what's going to happen to them. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, What do you think of me? At that point, everybody says it. We think good of you. You're, you're a good person. You're not going to do anything. You're a good person. At that moment, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, I'm going to do the same thing that Yusuf alayhi sallam did to his brothers. La tathriba alaykum al If we want to compare ourselves Compare ourselves to them. If we haven't gotten to that level, then what are we prideful over? How many times do we, somebody does something wrong to us, and we almost feel like I'm entitled to be angry towards you? I don't have to forgive you. You don't deserve my forgiveness. I'm going to tell you one lesson that I've learned in my life. And it's something that I've, I've always said to myself. You don't forgive because who the person is. You don't forgive because of who the person is. You don't forgive for the person. Meaning, whether that person asks you or doesn't ask you, it's irrelevant. Whether that person is a family member or not, is irrelevant. So when I say forgive for that person, would mean that they ask you for forgiveness. You don't forgive for that reason. You don't forgive because they're related to you, they're your children. You forgive only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then forgiving becomes very easy. You know why it becomes so easy? How many of us can sit here and say, I've done nothing wrong? 
in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you can say that, then impressive. But the reality for every one of us is that we have some weakness, some mistake in our life, something wrong we've done. And the same way we want Allah to forgive us, then the same way we forgive them unconditionally. But you don't do it for them. You do it. Why? Because you tell yourself something. Allah, I cannot do enough ibadah to get, to get your jannah. But I can forgive the one who did me wrong. And I hold that to you, Ya Allah. That I forgave him for when he did me wrong. He didn't ask me. He didn't deserve it because he didn't change. But I forgave him anyways. Or I forgave her anyways. Oh Allah, I did it only for your sake. So that when you pass away, and you go to Allah, and you say, Allah, I didn't do enough ibadah. But I forgave so and so and so and so, so that so and so wouldn't suffer. Imam Shafi rahmatullahi said, anyone who has ever backbited me, anyone who ever will backbite me, anyone who has ever said anything to me, I have forgiven all of them. And his reasoning was, I don't want it to be that I am there on the day of Qiyamah, and another person who is Muslim has to go through Jahannam and to suffer a little bit because I didn't forgive them. Forgiving is very easy when you do it for Allah and at, and, and, and at the end of the day, you're doing it for yourself. You're doing it for yourself. So Yusuf alayhi salam, يَغْفِرُ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ وَهُوَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاهِمِينَ Now, at this point, Yusuf alayhi salam, he wants to bring the entire family here. So what does he tell his brothers? He tells his brothers, Take this shirt, idhabu bi qamisi hadha. And it is said, what is that shirt? If you remember a long time ago, we started Yusuf alayhi salam's story. Yusuf alayhi salam was thrown in a well. And they took his clothes off and he was thrown in a well. And we said at that time, Yusuf alayhi salam had like a little, you know, I wouldn't say taweez, but like, like a taweez in which there's like a leather cloth and it is sewn to, and it conceals something inside of it, right? So just understand that. He had something around his neck that Yaqub alayhi salam put and it, the, the shirt of Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he was in the fire, Yaqub alayhi salam folded up as much as he could. Wallahu alam of how, how well this was done. And then he sewed it into something and wrapped it around Yaqub alayhi, Yusuf alayhi salam. So it is said that that same shirt, which was Ibrahim alayhi salam's shirt, that Yusuf alayhi salam still had in his possession, that is the shirt he sent. He sent. He sent that shirt to be thrown on his father's face. Because he told his brothers, if you put this on our father's face, Yati Basira, his eyesight will come back. And then Yusuf alayhi salam, he tells his brothers, You bring all of them to Misr, to Egypt. And that answers the question for why this surah was revealed. If you can't remember, the question was, they asked, why did Yaqub alayhi salam go to Egypt? Why did he go there? Yusuf alayhi salam told him to come. And that was the story. So that actually, this is the answer to the question for why this surah was revealed. But of course, we know there's a little bit more. Inshallah, we'll continue on. You know, I gotta, we gotta start slow because it's hard to kind of get back into the rhythm of this. So inshallah, we'll leave it here. Now it is said, how many of them were there? Wallahu alam, some narrations say there were 73 in total. Some narrations say there were 93. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Inshallah, we'll continue from here. Next week. Wa akhudawana. Alhamdulillah. Was there 73 and 92? How many family members there were in total? So, children's children and all that. Um, and Wallahum, there's different narrations. So, as to how many there were. Wa akhudawana. Alhamdulillah.